is as the title shows to us, we're going to look at the subject of evolution from a scientific point of view. I'm not primarily answering it from a scriptural point of view, but from a scientific point of view. And I'm trying to show to you that really it does not stand up at all. Now, first of all, let's look at this. We're not looking at it in any detail. We're going to be moving quite quickly tonight. But one of the key things is that all the key writers of the scriptures, Moses, Isaiah, Malachi, Peter, Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, all agree that God created man and the life upon this earth. It was God that did it. The writers of the word of God all agree that Yahweh did that in six states. And of course, as we know from Scripture, in Genesis chapter 1, it very clearly states to us, doesn't it? Day by day, what God did so that he might establish upon this earth the creation that we are well aware of. Now those days are days of 24 hours. Look, just have a look at this quote here from Exodus chapter 21, talking about the Sabbath. And he said, You shall do no work, not do not, not any work, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. The Sabbath is a 24-hour period. It's one of those days. It is the seventh day. And so we can see that each of those days were 24-hour periods. That's what the Scriptures very clearly states to us. But now, brethren and sisters, what we want to do is to look at this air subject from a scientific point of view. I want to pause for a minute and tell you a little bit of a story, give you a little bit of a background. I used to try and preach every time I went to university, every day. Most people, when you go and you preach to them, back in our days you could talk about religion. But if they didn't want to talk about religion, I would talk to somebody new each day, if I could, on evolution. So I had a lot of opportunities to argue these issues when I was young. Then when I became a school teacher, and I began to teach in New Zealand, my, the headmaster made me, because he was religious, head of the science department. There were six other teachers in that department. And it went a little while, and then suddenly I had an insurrection in my camp. In a staff meeting they said, you've got to stop it. You're teaching the kids creation. I said, yes, that's right. You've got to teach evolution. Well, I, do, I said, I do teach evolution, but I show that it is not scientific. I point out to them that. Oh, because I said, I've got to be honest. They said, well, the law says you've got to teach evolution, not creation. I said, well, I wouldn't be a true scientist if I didn't also teach creation. And so they argued with me on this. I said, look, let's solve the problem. We'll have a debate. So we had a debate in the school over one of the lunch hours. There were six of them, one of me. The debate proceeded through that lunch hour. At the conclusion of that lunch hour, I went up to my classroom, very nervous, wondering how it all went. The kids burst in, said, it's all over. I said, what do you mean? They said, they'll never debate with you again. And they were right. They never, ever challenged me in a staff meeting or publicly again, ever. And what it was, was because what I believe, I stuck to the foundations of evolution. Now, I want to ask you, if ever you get involved in a discussion with people, stick to the foundation. You'll always meet somebody who's a professor or a doctor or somebody who knows a lot about something. You'll know more about one subject than you know about that subject. But if you stick to the foundations, the whole thing collapses. Now, on that background, now let's look at what we're going to look at. What we're doing is we're looking at the question of whether indeed this is sound, whether it is indeed scientific. Here is the Bible. It's never been disproven since the time it was written. We have copies, manuscripts, 2,200 years old. Let's go on from there. So, what we want to do is look at this question and see if it is indeed scientifically sound. To talk about the subject first of science, let's go to the Oxford English Dictionary. The Oxford English Dictionary states that science must be able to be proven by observation. 
It must be able to predict what will happen, and on the other side of it must be also capable of being proven wrong if it is false. To be a true science, it must fulfil those three criteria. Now, let's think about what we are talking about here. Is this subject truly a science? Well, in order to look at that subject, and we're going to come back to that point a little later and make our conclusions. But to come to that point, I'm going to look at the six key points on which I believe evolution is based. There they are. Don't remember them. We're going to look at each of them one by one. Now, I might pause again. I'm going to be moving reasonably quickly tonight. I'm going over fairly heavy stuff. If you've got a question you'd like to ask, certainly please ask me afterwards. I'll be delighted to talk about it. No doubt about it. I'd like, though, particularly to give you the broad concepts of an approach, which later on, if you ever desire to do it, you can fill it in yourself when you're talking to somebody on the subject of evolution. Let's look at it. First of all, could it occur? And we're going to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, we all know that law, although we might not know it as the second law of thermodynamics. What does that law state? It states that Entropy must decrease. Now that sounds highly sophisticated. All it means is things become untidy. All it means is molecules become untidy. And it is a law of nature. And so it's like gravity. You drop an object, it falls. We never see it go the other way. It's a law of nature. And what it means is this, that if we take a tray of made up marbles like that, put the lid on and shake it up with a bit of space, doesn't come out in the shape of a Union Jack, more ordered. It comes out in a state of chaos. Again, if you, you know, buy a car, many, many years ago, you might have bought one like that. And here it is today, what is it? It's a state of mass chaos. That's a law of nature. And again, it happens to us. We might be born, beautiful, lovely child, but we end up in a tomb. We decay, we degenerate. We fall apart. And you know, that's exactly what's happening. Look at this. But it works. Disorders in medical areas. Where are the things that are more ordered? Here are these illnesses that have come due to mutations, the various types of mutation they say have taken place. Well, these are all faults. All of these. Down syndrome, haemophilia, you name it. And they're increasing all the time because we're going a long way from the time when Yahweh sits up when he created us perfectly. We are becoming disordered, degenerate. And there's no case of it going the other way. And so we can see that second law of thermodynamics is true. A law of nature that things go from order to disorder means that evolution could not occur. Because it requires things to go from disorder, molecules, to a state of order. A sophisticated person like us, or an animal. It's ridiculous. It doesn't happen. But now, let's move on to the next point. Was it likely to happen? Now we're going into the laws of probability. Mathematics. Let's have a look at that for a moment. Now, what do they say takes place? They say this that our body is sophisticated, the molecules in it are highly sophisticated, and we have within them our genes, 46 chromosomes, okay, on which the genes are attached. That's part of the human genome. Now, when mum and dad come together and a baby is developed, <clears throat> when we come to that situation, that cell that is developed in the womb of the mother, which grows into being the child, contains within it, they claim about 2 to 4 percent at the year 2000, of the whole human genome was what dictated what we were. The rest, they said, was just molecules which were rubbish, the remnants of evolutionary processes that had taken place. Now, from the year 2000 to last two years ago, 2012, 12 years, the scientific world has been studying the human genome. And over those 12 years, the number of scientists that have been working on it has grown 
to 442 scientists. It's a major project for 12 years. And the conclusion of that, they were breathtaking. They concluded that everything that they had studied has a place and a purpose, and it is in the purpose, uh, and it is necessary for the life of that individual. They are absolutely breathtaking by what they have discovered. Now, what does it mean? It means this. We've got 46 chromosomes, but what's the rest of those genetic molecules? They are switches. So that you get that cell that comes from mother's womb, and it develops you know, cells in your toe, little baby's toe, or little baby's head. In the toe, the switches switch in such and such a way that it grows toe cells. But if it's up in the brain, it's switched in such a way it grows brain cells or kidney cells, and such like. They are absolutely breathtaking at the utter sophistication of the human body and also of that initial cell from which we were born. There is no rubbish that they have found. No remnants from evolution that they have found. We could go on to that in more detail, but so could life have occurred? Could life through atoms spontaneously come together in this hugely sophisticated way? So they put together the message and they asked some of the people, the key science mathematicians, whether that's so, and this is the probability. It's absolutely breathtaking. The chance is one in some huge, massive number for that to have happened. It's just beyond credibility that that could happen spontaneously by pure chance. It is just ridiculous. And so here is a gentleman, one of the scientists, Professor Murray Eden, writing in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the key institutes in the USA, and he points out this. This has shown that a mere six mutations are required to bring about a single adaptive change. But to get some, and that would require many years. But for two dozen adaptive changes, two dozen genes to be changed, which would be necessary for to, say, to change the colour of your eye or any minor point, he says, would require 10,000 10, million years. Much older than anybody claims the Earth is. That is, if it was just by pure chance, the changes were taking place. That's how long it would require. It's beyond comprehension that that could happen. So let's move on. We take up this question. Um, let, I'll skip that one if you don't mind. Let's take this, for instance, our human body. We, a few years ago, they said there are parts of our body that we don't use. They're just leftovers from evolution. See this, here's our backbone. Here's the little tail here. That's where when we were a monkey or whatever we were before we were human beings, where the tail hung on to. That's the coccyx bone, coccyx bone there. But they're not saying that anymore. Here we are, we're going to one of the leading books on human anatomy, Gray's Anatomy, and another book on laser spine from the Laser Spine Institute. And they say this, that that bone probably known as a coccyx, situated at the very end of the spinal column, the tailbone derived its name because some people believed it was left over part of the human evolution. But it's now proved to be extremely important. It's absolutely critical in our capacity to sit comfortably, to stand comfortably. Huge numbers of tendons, ligaments and such like are attached to it. And so we can see it is utterly critical for our normal operation. Let's go on a little bit further. Here's another one. You know, when I was young, if you had a problem uh, with your appendix down here and it became inflamed, they just cut it out to the way. You lost them. They said, oh, you don't need it. It's rubbish left over from evolution days. Not anymore. Not anymore. Now they say it's utterly critical for our digestion processes. It contains it produces vitamins, it supports the immune system, it, it, it keeps down bad bacteria under control, it prevents allergies. 
So you've got a problem with the inflamed appendix, so you go to the doctor now, and they'll do anything to allow you to keep those appendix. They do not readily move to, uh, and cause an operation to allow you or cause you to lose those appendix. It's they are finding that almost every part of the body that they know of is in, has got a purpose and it's got a place there. It's how God made us. So it's hugely sophisticated. Come on. Here we go. Probability laws therefore demands that the sophistication of the human body did not come by chance. So let's move on. Because time's running away from us a little. Was there enough time for it to occur? I want to pick this point out particularly for a moment. How old has it been, the creation upon this earth? That's what we want to know about. And I want to come aside a moment and spend a second on this to expand on a little because theistic evolution, that's the claim that God used evolution in the process of creating human beings and animal life, plant life on this earth. That requires millions of years to accomplish. That's what they say. Let's read what they say. Theistic evolution, uh, evolutionists tend to believe that the Earth is billions of years old and the geological col column contains the fossil record represents long epochs of time. So for theistic evolution to occur, they say, it demands that this Earth and the creation on it is hugely old. Evolution doesn't happen rapidly. So we want to look now for a moment at the dating techniques. Now, just take one for example. There are many, carbon-14 to carbon-12, potassium to argon, uranium to lead. But here's the decay process from uranium-235 to lead-206. It decays, giving off nuclear particles in slow processes, and it takes a, a long time to occur. To go from there to there is a thousand years roughly. A huge period of time for half of it to decay to a special form of lead. Now, radioactive dating is dependent upon that. You get hold of a rock and you have a look how much this is there and how much has decayed to that. Because you know the half-life, you can work out the age of that rock, so they say. So let's have a look at it. Here's the carbon-14 decay. Say we've got carbon-14 in our body that has just been formed, just born, or has just died. Within the body or within the plant, there's carbon-14. The certain amount of that carbon-14, over 5,700 years, half of it decays. Another 5,700 years, half it's decayed, and so on. So you look at the percentage of carbon-14 to carbon-12 inside that body, put that marker on there, you can work out the age using that graph. And so you can date that rock. You can date it by that technique. Now, that's how they use, how they date the rocks using radioactive mechanisms. How valid, how accurate is it? Well, here we are, we've gone back to Dr. Morris some years ago in a book that he wrote, The Young Earth. And he, therefore, he got hold of some of the volcanoes. Potassium argon dating dates to the last time the rock was liquid. So he got hold of a crater over here in Arizona where they knew, from various historic reasons, the date of the rock. They sent the rock away. They didn't tell the people who were dating it where it came from, and that they knew roughly the age of that rock, and the answer came back not 900 years old, but 210,000 years old. Take away. They know the flows of Hawaii very clearly. And they can work that out. And brethren and sisters, the answer came from a flow that they knew took place 200 years ago, 140 million years old, to 2.96 billion years old. Ridiculous answers. Utterly ridiculous answers. But why? Well, that book was written in 1994. Another book has been written again, where they did the same. And they came up with similarly ridiculous answers for flows that they knew well. St. Helens took place in 1980. Sent the rock away to be dated and look at the answer they got. 
2.8 million. Ridiculous answer. Why? Well, there's several reasons. First of all, there is an error in the measurements of those days. Always. There is background radiation coming from the sun. So the equipment they use to measure the radiation in the rock always has a plus and minus error factor. Let's put that error factor on the graph. There it is. So that error factor wouldn't mean much up there. I mean, instead of the H being there, it'd only be microscopically different using that error factor. But now put it down here. Let's shift it to there. Now put on the error factor there, and it could be anywhere from there, that's 15,000 years, to infinity. Infinity. You can take what you like. It's ridiculous. But further to that, the Earth experiences bombardments of radiation from the sun. Now, this is a picture that's been squeezed together. There's the sun, there's the Earth. Now, we are protected from that radiation from the sun in the mercy of our Heavenly Father by a magnetic field around the Earth. Okay, here you can see it again. There we can see it, the picture of the magnetic field. North Pole, South Pole. That magnetic field causes the radiation to come from the Earth's sun to swerve out, to be pushed away. The radiation coming from the sun is very often charged. Charged particles, as they come into a magnetic field, are moved away. We use that in electric motors. As the electricity goes through the wiring, in the presence of the magnet, it will cause that electric motor to spin. But in this case, as the radiation comes toward the Earth, it hits what we call the magnetic field of the Earth, and it's caused to be pushed away. Protecting life upon this Earth. If the magnetic field of the Earth was to die out, the radiation coming from the Sun would bombard the Earth and would destroy life upon it. It is a known fact. Now, let's have a look at this. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. Down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the lava coming up under it has pushed the strata slowly, slowly, slowly apart. Lava usually contains within it basaltic lava, iron. When that lava becomes solidified, inside the little pits of iron, the magnetic field of the Earth is stored. They know what it is. It's locked in place. All right? You get a piece of iron, heat it up red hot, and then allow it to cool down fast, it will become magnetic, and it will be the same magnetism as the Earth's magnetic pole in the position in which it was cooled. So they can track the changes in the magnetic field of the Earth. And they found as they go away from that fault line here, here it is represented, they find the magnetic field of the Earth is perhaps stored, 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 and it's exactly the same on either side. Exactly the same on either side. But what they have found is that between the times when the magnetic field of the Earth was pointing north-south, and times when it's actually flipped and gone south-north, there has been no magnetic field on the Earth. And they conclude that there has been a reversal of 170 times, oh, and in those 170 reversals, for an average of 200 years, there was no magnetic field. If there was no magnetic field, the Earth was bombarded with radiation from the sun. Now, pause. I get hold of radioactive material. I take that radioactive material like uranium, half-life of a thousand odd years, and I put it inside a nuclear, in a nuclear bomb, in a nanosecond, or two nanoseconds, the uranium will completely decay. Completely decay. But similarly, if I take an input inside a nuclear reactor, within about a week it's all gone. Now, if the sun has no magnetic field to protect the Earth from the radiation, the radiation bombards the Earth. Every rock that's got radioactive particles in it will decay rapidly. And that means that every rock you like to pick up will give an old age. Give an old age. 
And that's exactly what they're saying. They say, oh, look, proof. I'm going for these animals. We found these fossils. We dated these fossils. Look, it's all coming up with really old age. Of course it is. Because the reversal, the last reversal, they say, of the Earth's magnetic field was when man first was noticed in fossil record being present in Europe. That's what they say. Now, how long did it take that? Very shortly after the time of creation. No doubt about it. And so, any dating of any fossil record after the creation or attempt to do so, anything that's got a fossil in it, will always come up with a, mo a very old date. We could look at it in a slightly different way. If we dated the radioactive, the strength of the Earth's magnetic field at the moment is decaying. This is the situation today. It, it, the magnetic field is weaker and that's the situation as it is now with our Earth's magnetic field and the strength that it is. Because it is a weaker magnetic field, more radiation is getting in, more carbon-14 is produced. But you see, a little while ago, we know from evidence that we've done in science that the Earth's magnetic field was stronger. Ask me after and I'll give you evidence for that. So in the past, the rock was getting less carbon-14 because the magnetic field of the Earth was stronger at that time, keeping the radiation out. So therefore, if the date of a rock, say, was that, or a fossil was that, really and truly, it should have been that, much younger. So no matter which way you look at these things, it doesn't stack up scientifically. And you push the scientists on these key fundamental issues and they will fold. I've tackled a professor on it on one occasion. And he went so far with it, he just stopped. Anyhow, let's leave that time training away from us. There are many alternative methods for dating the age of the Earth. Here's one that I find quite fascinating. There's the feet of man on the moon. On the surface of the moon, dust has been formed because it's got it's, the moon's got a gravitational strength like the earth. Dust is falling from so outer space onto the earth and it's also falling onto the moon. Because the moon's one sixth the size of the earth, one sixth of the rate of, radio, uh, of dust is accumulating on the moon. But it is accumulating. Now if the moon is millions and millions of years old, how much dust would you expect to be there? Probably kilometres thick. There's nothing to wash it away. There's nothing to compact it. It just settles. When man landed on the moon, they went out in a car or a vehicle to check off the thickness of the dust. That was one of the things they did. And it remained the same consistently, around about two centimetres. Two centimetres. And their conclusion was that that would have had to be a very, very young time or a very recent time, the moon was put into its position. And that's what we know, don't we, from Genesis chapter 1. Uranium and thorium yield alpha particles. Alpha particles is helium. Helium is a gas that's light and floats up, but doesn't escape the Earth's atmosphere. If the Earth has been here for millions and millions of years, and radiation, alpha particles have been given off by decaying substance like uranium and such like, there ought to be huge amounts of helium in the atmosphere. Guess how much there is? 0.00052%. Almost nothing. <coughs> how old is the Earth? The evidence is substantially pointing to a young Earth. And you can take things like Niagara Falls, the rate of the retreat of Niagara Falls, and the age of that. The upper limit, they say, 9,000 years probably more likely 6,000 years to the time of creation. But let's move on. Um, the Earth's sun is burning up. It's burning up and reducing in size, so the scientists say, at a rate of around about 1.54 metres per hour. I don't know if you know the law E equals mc squared, very famous one, but mass converts to energy, doesn't it? Einstein stated that. 
And so consequently, as the radiation is coming from the sun to the earth, and to other parts of outer space, the sun is shrinking. Do the sums yourself. It's not hard to do. I did it to check off. If that was so, how long ago it would have been if the scientists are correct, the sun touched the earth? Comes up to 11 million years. But they say the earth is billions of years old. So even their own facts and figures show that this could not be true. The earth would have been burnt up if the earth was millions and millions of years old. Well, there are many mechanisms. There's a few others, some of which I've already listed. So we can see that radioactive uh, dating methods are dependent on stable <laughs> decay rates. This did not occur. This did not occur. And so you cannot rely on the dating mechanisms that they have proposed. Let's move on. Do fossils show that there is enough time for it to occur? So did, you know, strata lay steadily and form fossils and so forth over millions of years? Let's have a look at it. Here's a bit of the strata of the Grand Canyon. And here are some of the various types of rocks that they have recorded inside there. But what they say is that everything was laid down systematically, methodically, strata by strata, and so on. Is that true? Well, let's have a look at it. Just take the Grand Canyon for a moment. They go down there, and all the rocks seems to be joined together with no major breaks. But then when you look at the dates, do the sums yourself, the ages of these rocks, there is missing a period of 175 million years. And yet where the break comes, you can't see that. <coughs> you can't see the break. It's illogical what they're saying. Illogical. Now I'm going to show you a few pictures from Australia. <laughs> Here we are. Because I did this first, of course, in Australia. I apologise for that. But uniformism or catastrophism. Did the strata lay slowly but surely? Or did it dynamically, violently take place? Have a look at Australia. I don't know if you know this is a place called Wilpina Pound in South Australia where we live. And the strata is folded dramatically like this. The up folds have been moved away, destroyed, gone. Look at this. Strata on its edge. Again over here. Massive distortions have taken place. Here's another place you might know of. The Olgas. Ayers Rock. Look at the strata there on edge. And they say that strata, or those deposits, are one and the same. About 50 kilometres away, it comes out of the ground like that. What distorted the rocks of the earth like this? How did it ever happen? Why did this happen? And look at the Grand Canyon. Was that a slow erosion? Look at the sides of it. It was ripped out. This earth has not had a steady, systematic laying, but it is a dynamic changes that are happening in this earth. It's been catastrophic. And proof positive of that, but we flew over that only a few days ago, but there is the Matterhorn. And the Matterhorn's upside down. If we believe the people who do the dating mechanisms, you see, the young rocks on the bottom, the old rocks on the top. How did it ever go upside down? Nobody gives you an explanation for it. And then you see, here in America, they've got this. This is called Chief Mountain. And the problem is, when you look at these rocks here, this here is much older than these rocks here. And they say, well, they're really, really puzzled by this. And the conclusion is that these rocks here, that strata and there, that slid over the top of these younger rocks, required a movement of these great mountains of 70 kilometres. How often have you seen one of these great mountains, 70 kilometres, moving past you for over a distance of 70 kilometres? It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And yet that's the only thing they can use to explain it. It's staggering. And have a look at the fossils themselves. 
were they slowly, slowly trapped in the dark, in the strata of the rocks and in the and in the deposits, sediments? Look at this one, caught in the middle of eating another fish. Look at these one, crabs. You get in the beach. How long do they last? They decay in only a few, a few days, aren't they? Here we are, jellyfish. Here we are, another one. Look at the detail of it. That was not slowly but surely deposited. It was dynamically trapped. Again, USA only a few years ago got from, Amer from Russia one of the woolly mammoths. Only a baby one. Still frozen. Still frozen. And they opened it up and they found even in the blood vessels they could still see parts, traces of the red colour in the blood. How come that's preserved like that? Some of them they opened up and they found in their mouth grass which they hadn't swallowed, hadn't decayed. What causes these animals to be trapped like that? And then not decay. People went up there many years ago to get the ivory from them. Russia used to be the world's leading exporter of ivory. And when they went up there to find these woolly mammoths in the frozen waste, the men would feed their dogs on the meat of the woolly mammoth. And they didn't die because it was rotten or something like that. It was still preserved. What caused that to happen? Something violent, something dynamic. Again, look at these trees stored in strata. And there's the whole tree. How quickly did that get buried? Rapidly. Rapid storage of it. Now look, take this. Here's a mine in Australia called the Gympie Mine. In the 1950s they mined a certain material there and then the price of it dropped, so they closed the mine. It got flooded with water. Underground they built a room where the men could come together and have their morning tea and their lunch hours. All out of wood, electrical wiring and so forth. Suddenly the price of the goods that were mined there went up. So they drained the mine, pumped the water out, opened it up, and they went down, and lo and behold, they found the room had turned to rock. It had solidified since 1956. How long does it take for fossils to form? Only a tiny period, given the right circumstances. Again, let's look at, here's another thing. Here's some footprints of dinosaurs. Oh, they were millions of years ago. And in the middle of one is the footprint of a human being. So when did they live? They lived at the same time. How long ago? Not many as years ago. And the are maximum of 6,000 years ago. And so we can see that this area of... This shows to us there is a real fault in the analysis that they are using. The idea of the youngest rocks being at the top and the oldest at the bottom is not always valid. And the formation of those fossils over millions of years is not always a valid piece of reason. Listen to what the Encyclopedia Britannica says. Of it. it cannot be denied that, from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by the study of their remains buried in rock. And the relative ages of the rock are determined by the remains of the, that they contained. And so it's circular reasoning, really. They're using one thing to prove the other, or the other to prove the first. It doesn't stack up scientifically. And the Encyclopedia Britannica is admitting that uniformitarianism is, is not valid, since the Earth experience, well, the Encyclopedia Britannica didn't say that, but it is indeed true. Uniformitarianism, the steady laying down of strata, is not valid, because the Earth experienced a catastrophic history. Just to pause for a second, when I went through university many years ago, a book came out. It was called Earth in Upheaval. And there was a queue line a mile long to get that book. It took me three months to get it. The book came out under a science fiction label. It was written by a man by the name of Velen Kosky. He was a scientist. And he, though, believed the Earth had a catastrophic history. And he wrote this book on it. And he couldn't get a scientific press to print it. So it came out in a science fiction label. 
and it also hit the media that it came out as a science fiction label, and as a consequence, a huge number of the young people wanted to get it and read it. I think it sold more as a consequence. But it's very interesting. He had a very good friend, very good friend, a scientist, a scientist I think you might know his name. And he helped to, he argued the points through with him, and they spent many nights, he said, discussing the issues behind it, and then finally the book was printed. His friend who helped him assisted him and gave to him some advice on it was Einstein. Einstein. Two Jews working together. Einstein did, it appear, believe in a catastrophic history of the Earth. But anyhow, is there a biological mechanism that allows this to occur? Well, brothers and sisters, they say the survival of the fittest. Well, let's have a look at this issue. Here's a example of what most people point out is a classic example of evolution, the pepper moth. See the pepper moth found here in Britain? There are the white ones and then there are the dark ones. Many years ago, industrial revolution came in and many of the trees came, changed colour. And the result, they say, was that these peppered moths, which were once like that, evolved, uh, sorry, the ones that were like that, evolved to that colour then, as time went by. But as time went by, more recently Britain, here, has cleaned up its environment. The result is the trees have changed colour back back to what they were before. So they're now coloured a little bit like that. Now they said, look, these animals, they evolve from that to that because survival of fittest. Trees dark, they would be very fitter like that. Now what they found is, now they've gone back to being like that. <coughs> no, they haven't. What they found was, there were both two colours. And the one that was the most easily seen by the insect, uh, by the birds, were the ones that were consumed. So when the trees were dark, these were destroyed by the birds. They captured those and ate them. When the trees cleaned up, because of you know, pollution being reduced, the result became, first of all, they found both. And then they found uh, these were the colours <coughs> that survived most. It wasn't evolution. They were there before. There were two colours. That was rubbish what they were presenting. And that is still presented as classic proof of evolution in the scientific magazines. But now for just a moment, let's just take one example, the eye. The eye is hugely sophisticated. 100 million photoreceptors at the back of the eye. The back of every eye on the retina. It converts into an electrical pulse that sends it by the optic nerve to the brain. The brain transforms that into information which we understand as what we see. Now, for that to evolve, I, Darwin would have told you that it evolved by various different processes, you know, gradually, spontaneously, till finally it conveyed benefits to, human, to the organism that had it, whether it's the human eye or the bird's eye or whatever. Now look at it carefully. If we take that subject of the evolution of the eye, from there to there, where it began. Taking the evolution's point of view for a moment, it would have evolved for a long, long time before it was first able to detect light. They say, oh yeah, but it conveys a benefit to the animal, and so survival of the fittest, it therefore, the animal that has the best eye will survive better than the one that has the worst eye. But for the bulk of its evolutionary period, it conveyed no benefit whatsoever. Here are the pictures of Darwin's, Darwin's pictures of it, of the eye and its evolution. But he draws his first picture where it can actually detect light at that point. So over this period, the mechanism of survival of the fittest cannot work. It's only by pure, utterly pure chance that it could develop. And the chance of that to come to pass with the huge sophistication of the human eye is impossible to conceive. Utterly ridiculous to conceive. Take another thing. Here's a bird, woodpecker. The woodpecker is an incredible bird. It pecks wood 
to get a worm out of that wood. He hits that wood at rates of 100 shots or 100 hits a minute. And when it does hit that, it pecks, its beak hits that wood at 100 kilometres an hour on average. Now, consequently, it needs, as you can well imagine, a crash helmet. It needs more than a crash helmet. It needs a special connective tissues like shock absorbers there. Otherwise, it'd be concussed. Tough connecting tissues so it can hold the beak in place. It needs short, powerful legs, vice-like toes to hold on as it hits 100k. Just pause and think. If we were in a car accident and we hit the windscreen at 100k, how would we go? But he's doing it every day. And not only that, every minute. 100, minute, 100 times a minute. And so you can see, just by pure chance, he develops this you know, special beak that can do that. Crash helmet, special eyes that can cope with the uh, splinters and the crash helmet head and so forth. All by pure chance before he can get his first worm. All has to be there. Along with this tongue that he developed that can pull out the birds, uh, that pull out the insects. Take migratory skills of birds. However did that happen? Here's the migratory paths of birds over the Pacific Ocean. And I want to pick up one particular one, the great shearwater. He migrates from up here every year down to the Tristan Islands and then back. The bird is born up here. Mother hatches the bird. Then it grows strong enough and away it flies. Why? Why? Down to the Tristan Island. Because that's where it meets its partner. There male and female bird come together. Then the birds fly back there and the bird is, the eggs are born. New babies are born. Now how come they can get to that particular island and not miss? Now that island is a, just a staggering island. It's actually a small group of islands. But it's 3,000 kilometres from the nearest island. How can it find it? Now, you just imagine, there's mum. The eggs hatch and out comes the little baby. And she's straight away training that baby so she can find the right boyfriend or girlfriend down at the Tristan Islands. The other end of the earth. How does it do it? Well, what they did was they got hold of one of these migratory birds and they stuck it in an aircraft hangar made of metal. No magnetic field inside of an iron container. So no magnetic field, the birds flew around chaotically. So what they first of all is they projected up onto the roof the pictures of the stars and moved down one way. They turned around, moved the other way. They switched that off. They said, what if it's, they also follow the magnetic field? And they put a magnetic field in there, north pole there, south pole there, down they fly. Then they turned the polarity around, they flew the other way. They were breathtaking. These birds are reading the stars. These birds have got a compass. And only about two years ago, they did this. They found a chromosome which actually exists in the eye of pigeons, migrated pigeons. And what they found is it responded to the magnetic field of the Earth. So they cut the back of the eye and they put in the back of the eye a photoreceptor. And they allowed the bird, or they used that photoreceptor to see what it saw, and this is what they said. It got a bright spot when it was flying north. The bright spot formed there. If it flew down toward the south, during the daytime, the bright spot was there. At night time, while flying north, a dark spot. And when flying south, a dark spot to the south. It's got a compass in its eye. Absolutely stunning. How in the heck did that happen? God did it. An amazing accomplishment, isn't it? But it, how did it find the Tristan Islands? Why didn't it fly down to the South Pole? Well, what they found also is that it can detect the angle of the magnetic field of the Earth. And the North Pole is like that, South Pole is like that, the equator is like that, and here in Britain it's probably a bit like that. In Australia where we are, it's like that. The bird detects that, and by that mechanism, it can find out for itself the latitude 
and longitude that he needs to find to get that island to get his partner. Stunning, you know. Utterly stunning. You know, we have a plane. We're going to fly home. They've got all these devices so they can fly. But they can get lost. If the equipment fails, they can get lost. The bird don't. <coughs> or it might get blown off course. But it didn't get lost. And so we can see, brethren and sisters, the sophistication of all living things shows no evidence of evolution. One last point. Fossil paleontology. What we're looking at is the fossil record now, just for a moment. Let's see what we can see there. Do you know, back in the 1980s, I've still got this record, uh, this Newsweek article at home. The Newsweek magazine came out saying this. The missing links between man and the apes, whose absence has comf comforted religious fundamentalists, that's us, is merely the most glamorous of a whole hierarchy of phantom creatures. In other words, the missing links, the phantoms, they don't exist. In the missing, in the fossil record, missing links are the rule. The more scientists have searched for the transitionary forms between the species, the more they've been frustrated. They're not there. Oh yes, they say they found things. Piltdown man, a hoax, Java man, a slim fossil effort evidence, only a few fossils. Uh, Osteopolithus, the result of one bone. Heidelberg man. They got hold of the fossils of that man and they took the bones of it and they took it they showed it to a, a, a doctor who was used to dealing with bones and problems. He says that man's got an osteomyelitis. Oh but they said no oh, he's a missing link because he's got a bent back. He walks like a you know orangutan. No, said the doctor, that's nothing of the sort. Those fossils only rec represent somebody who's got an illness. And so we can see, we're not going to spend time on this, our time's really gone. But the fossil record, the Piltdown Man, has been proven to be an utter hoax. It came out many, many years ago, and even the one who proposed the idea, on his death, he said, yes, I, I, I cooked that up. And yet by the time he stated that, there have been over 300 scientific heavy scientific articles on the veracity of that fossil record or that fossil, that hoax. <laughs> and so you can see how clearly the scientists are being duped by their own uh, conceptions. Let us stray by. So here's a few of the examples. And so we can say, putting that together, the expected hosts of missing links has not been found. Only hoaxes or a few scattered bones have been discovered. And so since the time of Darwin, in the 140, 155 years since Darwin wrote the origi origin of the spe species, no irrefutable scientific evidence has ever been put forward to prove that evolution occurred. It's rubbish. And I'll be very happy to debate with anybody in reference to that. So come back to what Oxford Bible Dictionary says. What happened? Can it be proven wrong? We've got no evidence. And yet the scientific world dogmatises it's right. So is that science? If the Oxford Bible Dictionary is correct, it's nothing of the sort. Nothing of the sort. It's still a theory, and the theories are testable and ideally, prove, uh, ideally falsifiable. Evolution is neither because you cannot prove it wrong. Scientists won't accept it. They say it's right. It is therefore simply a false idea, not even a sound theory. And so we can see the effect of that. But I want to go one step further by way of conclusion. And I'll point out this. Evolutionary theory is ruining modern society, says this book. Darwin has, an, has had a devastating impact on society. Let me pause for a moment and just pick up one particular point in reference to that. My belief is that we probably never would never have had the Second World War if we didn't have the theory of evolution. Here's a person we know, Hitler. What's the master race, the German race? 
What's the most inferior race? The Jewish race. So what does he say? We'll go to war, we'll annihilate all the other, we'll defeat all the other countries, and we'll progressively annihilate the inferior races. He was working and trying to convince his nation on the grounds of evolution. And it may well have been if that concept had not been proposed and so forthrightly put forward by the scientific world, we may never have had Second World War. Think of the devastation that that concept can, has produced. Brethren and sisters, how privileged we are that we have the Bible. And we have sound knowledge and understanding of truth. How crazy we would be if we ever deviated towards that mad, mad concept of evolution and its iniquitous consequences. Well, when I first produced this, this was a lecture. I don't suppose we need to go through this, but of course, as we know, Christ will return. It's one of the most incredible subjects of the scripture. It's used 318 times or referred to in the, Old, in the New Testament alone. It's one of the subjects of the great promise of the Bible. And it's my personal belief that Christ's return is only just around the corner. It is just amazing what we're seeing happening in places like Ukraine. Places like Germany at the moment and its support in the industrial, the, the businessmen's support for what Putin is doing. Not so much Putin, but they don't want to undermine him because they want to be aligned with him because of their business ties. We can see establishing before our very eyes the standing up of Daniel's image. It's beginning to happen. How long have we got, brethren and sisters? We do pray. Christ's return will be very soon. And I believe it will be. And so let us be people that are not going the foolish ways of evolution, mad, chaotic ways, but following the truth that is found in the Bible. And yes, believing in true science, which the Bible utterly supports. Thank you.